for dear. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for, for joining us here. Uh, I, obviously, I know a few of you from uh, the Master Naturals program, and uh, the focus that I was doing for you had to do with uh, building the habitat. And unfortunately, uh, you know, because of the road condition, rightly so, we're playing it safe and doing it by Zoom. So uh, we're going to be focused on solitary bees. Now, I know I've got a number of social bee experts out there. And uh, my background with this is I, I, about five years ago, I got involved with the Master Naturals program. And it took me a little over three years to get certified. And uh, the focus that I enjoy is teaching insects. And I typically, you're going to be my first adult group. I typically do K through 12. So I only have K through 12 kids to, eva to evaluate your participation based on. So uh, anyhow, so we're going to be focused on solitary bees. And this is kind of the title of my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm I'm a retired military, well, I'm still working, but I'm a retired military officer. I started my career as an infantry officer in the Marine Corps and ended up as a hospital administrator in the Air Force after, with about 32 years of service. And so uh, I look at solitary bees after I've studied them. They're really the special operations soldiers. And I'll explain that why they're why they do that, or why I think they're that. Okay, I like to start a program by jotting down some of what your expectations are from this program. And again, uh, I, I do also tell you here that I'm not going to be covering anything about plant selection uh, to attract solitary bees. The only thing that you know that I will emphasize, just like. Uh, in disaster recovery in the military, you know, it's about uh, shelter, water, and and food. So uh, just be aware that there are certain plants that attract solitary bees. And uh, anyhow, and I'm not going to go into a lot about the uh, diseases or predators, uh, nor am I going to overload you with uh, Latin terms. Uh, I'm going to try to stay at the order level, maybe drop it down a little bit to the family level. If you remember from seventh grade uh, uh, in biology or zoology, whatever you took in school, that the uh, you remember the, the breakdown in the taxonomy by King Philip came over for good spaghetti. So uh, we those of us that uh, teach insects like to remind people that many of you probably enjoy an insect um, in, in the sense of shrimp. <laughs> it, it is in the phylum uh, arthropod and it's a segmented body, but then uh, you drop down uh, into uh, order, you get into insect and of course uh, the uh, shrimp go into the creation order, not into the insect order. But anyhow, they are in the same phylum as insects. And uh, I learned the other day from my mentor, uh, and I, uh, as Dave knows from me and scouts, I'm big on our scouts when they do the American business merit badge with me of having a mentor. And so uh, I, I, uh, have a gentleman that is an entomologist and I call him up every once in a while and say, I read this. What do you think? And he, he, he gives me his uh, over 40 some years experience on that. And so uh, I'm not going to deal with any Latin words. We're again, kind of focused on habitat before I open it up to get, kind of get an idea on your, I want to make one, uh, share one little piece of, Gee whiz with you in the corner there. So we've known about these native bees or these, uh, what I, the solitary bees for quite a long time. That's a French uh, naturalist who ended up, believe it or not, he was very well respected by Darwin, but uh, 
Don, he kind of kept his faith. He didn't really go into uh, losing his faith like, unfortunately, Darwin did. But uh, uh, you can see there he uh, when he lived and when he passed on. The other interesting thing about him, uh, particularly since uh, some of the things I do with scouts over the Toyota plant, probably every kid in Japan knows about this guy. Burger King did this little thing to attract people to Burger King by giving away insects because it's kind of a common uh, father uh, child thing in Japan for them to go out and do insect hunting. And so uh, they all know about uh, Fabre and uh, they read about him. So anyhow, I'm going to pause right there. And if some of you would chime in and tell me exactly what you hope to get out of this, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, have we got them muted? Have I got people muted? They are, but they can unmute. Oh, I was just okay. going to say, I was going to say, don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's not, I don't see anyone in this group that's shy. So, <laughs> yeah. And if you just have general knowledge, just interest in general knowledge on solitary, uh, you know, while some of you are thinking, Dave Baker was kind enough when I did a program with scouts to collect some bees for me. And, uh, when you get down to the exact species, I've learned from uh, Laura Smith, who is uh, at our Western Department of Agriculture there at the Guthrie, uh, there in Charlotte. Well, it, you know, Guthrie's in that little community there. But anyhow, she's taught me that uh, you really got to have a microscope when you get down to the species level. And so we took some of those bees that Dave collected for me. And sure enough, we went up there and, and she had charts and other bees in her collection. And we tried to side by side compare what we had. And we, we used a microscope to try to do that. So it's a real challenge to try to identify uh, down to the species level. But anyhow, okay. Yeah, I, I, I do have uh, one thing uh, that, you know, we do run into you know, with what Clint and I do. We run into... Uh, you know, certain bees like we ran into those, and, and I forget what you called those. <laughs> the, the, well, uh, the what? We uh, we identified it up there as a mason bee. A mason bee. Okay. Yep. So anyway, um, you know, more of uh, you know how the their habitats. You know, okay. we we you know until we saw the sawdust, we didn't realize that they were a solitary bee. Yeah. You know, so, but uh, yeah, the ha the habitats and uh, um, as we're putting in the pollinator garden, how to attract those? Okay. Okay. And Dave, I, as I mentioned, I'm probably not going to go a lot into plant selection and uh, on that but I'll give you some resources to, to find out on that. But Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Nicole had a question in the chat. Okay. Thanks for um, looking at that for me. So she said, um, you know, she was interested in learning if there are types of solitary or mason bees that are better than the rest um, and finding out which ones are best for her area. Okay. All right. Um, I would be curious, um, I know you're not doing plants, but, um, and we've got a plan together for the habitat that we're building, but I would also probably be curious to see what the uh, benefits of having the solitary are um, with the social bees that we'll be having there. And then, you know, what, what types of things are best to attract them. I know some things about those, but I'd be curious to know, obviously more. Right. Okay. Uh, I guess my mine would be um, like, why do they call them super pollinators? Certain ones and, and certain things like that. Okay. Well, in plant selection, Dave knows this. Uh, I think Dave remembers this, but when his son Cade and I were at uh, last summer camp, 
Kate went around with me on a day. We participated in a citizen science project where we were taking pictures of plant uh, bumblebees. We were searching for them. Now, bumblebees are social bees. They're not solitary bees, but they're a heck of a good pollinator. But uh, anyhow, we went around and uh, the lady just issued her report on what plants uh, based on, it was the, uh, believe it or not, it was the National Geo uh, Geological, uh, so not association, are people that you think about on maps and you kind of wonder why are they doing bees? But anyhow, uh, okay. Well, anybody else, please feel free, like say you're adult learners and uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to jump in anytime and ask questions. So. I just I just appreciate you doing this today online, and I'm just in a learning process, and I'm going to be helping with the bee yard hopefully, and any information I can gather is just as uh, this excellent for myself. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Well, let me uh, let me get to the next slide here. Okay. Well, this is kind of uh, you get this one, you can go home. No, <laughs> Jerry, can I? Can I make, can I pause you for a second? Sure. So Steve asked a question in the chat and he said solitary bee is a new term to him and asked if you would maybe define what a solitary bee is. He's familiar with honeybees uh, living underground and um, was asking about them living underground in the area. So maybe you can define that, which is, it looks like that's kind of what you're getting ready to do, but. Um, it is. Yeah. What a lead in, what a lead in question. Yeah. I didn't have a good transition statement between my introduction, but thank you. That's it. Yeah. Well, uh, when you think of the order that uh, bees are in, they're in the order Hymenoptera. And in that particular order, they're considered mostly social insects. For example, ants are in that order because you know that with your uh Honeybees, Dave and Clint, and those others of you that do bees, my buddy here that's now on my sidekick, Barry, when you uh, do uh, honeybees, you know you're, you've got a queen, and you've got little workers that work to help the queen uh, with her duties, and of course, the males, their only duty is to reproduce and die, uh, and so... Uh, that's pretty much defining a social type insect. So there's individual uh, division of labor, a queen, and so on. With solitary bees, uh, like I mentioned with my special ops thing, that's one of the characteristics. They're all of that. They have to be the medic. They, I mean, they're everything. Uh, now we do obviously have males and females, and the male does the same thing once he, uh, uh, once he has, uh, once he, uh, uh, shoot, uh, once he does his uh, his duty, he he dies, and so. Uh, but and also the 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 lifespan. I know there. I've heard that there are queen bees that live. I'm heard someone say at least five years or maybe more these bees only live about uh, 60 days and we'll kind of get more into kind of when they come out and, and so on uh, they don't use a hive they don't carry honey and uh, the big one there on my slide and this is where I get the special ops one of these guys can do the work of 100 honeybees in terms of pollination they go at a, a flower like they throw their uh I'm trying to think of a football analysis there dave on that when they tackle it's kind of like you've hit the refrigerator man you know whatever that football player used to be called the refrigerator when they hit a when they hit a, a plant they just cover their whole body with pollen i don't have a photo but you can find some neat photos online of some of the solitary bees that have, you know, have pollen all over them. So uh, that's why they're, that's why they're so uh, a, a strong pollinator in, in, in the, uh, 
in that pollination uh, uh, insect or army kind of deal. The Also, they're native. I think most of you got, uh, folks know that raised bees, your honeybees are European, and our native uh, solitary bees uh, have been here. And as you probably, they've adapted, though, probably better than any other thing like the Asian ladybug or uh, the stink bug or something like that. They're not really a, a pest, so to speak, but I guarantee you, you can probably find somebody they're not happy with them. The other thing, uh, just like with your uh, honeybees, it's the female that has the stinger, but she's she rarely uses, she doesn't use that stinger. You really probably have to squash her to get her to sting you. So they're very docile type insects. And uh, so uh, that's for me that I have uh, a, a aller uh, allergic reaction to bee stings when I was a child. These are the kind of bees I like. So anyhow, all right. Any, uh, again, if I don't get to some of your questions, I'm checking your my questions here. But please feel free to ask, and if it's a slide I'm going to cover here in a minute, I, you know, we'll get more into some of the habitat. I'm, I do I'm want... curious. Oh, yes. Sorry, dear. I was just curious about, um, so when I'm working with kids um, and we're doing pollinators and I'm talking about butterflies, one of the fun facts that I like to share with them is that um, butterflies um, like to visit about 2,000 of their flower friends every day, and so I I asked the kids, I'm like, how many of you all have, you know, 2,000 friends that you can go visit every day? Well, you know, our pollinators visit, you know, a lot of different flowers and things. Do you know, like, how many, um, is there statistics for bees, like the solitary or maybe even the honeybees on how many um, flowers they would visit in a day or how many fields they would, you know, kind of try to gather pollen from? I I don't know that uh, Don I uh, I can't speak for the solitary bees. I make the assumption that once they uh, you know load themselves up, then they return to their that nest. That particularly you know we're talking about the females, and so every female, by the way, just to make sure you understand, every female is a queen. Uh, so once she gets to that nest. She's then going to start that process, if, you know, and the males are out early. So the, the pollination part, I mean, the uh, impregnation part has been done. And so she's starting to fill her, her nest up because she's only got 60 days to live. And, and you find that in the insect world that, you know, their, their deal is about continuation of their species. Um, so I, I really can't uh, make a comment about how how many plants they typically uh, cover in a day. You guys in the honeybee world, do you have an answer for on that one? I think it depends on how far though their flight would happen to be for that particular bee. But I've seen anything from fifty to a hundred flowers per day, just depending on the distance they're traveling. I think a neat thing if you're doing kids. Don on that and one I'm going to try this year with my uh, with the program I do for kids is have them do a waggle dance and teach them about the aspect of how the honeybee uses the sun and the navigation and the meaning of the waggle the waggle dance but oh that'd uh, be fun yeah yeah so yeah I with a honeybee also, it's, it depends on, you know, what's blooming at that time. I mean, you know, because they have their favorite, uh, you know, places to go. Like, you know, if it's uh, in the springtime, it's, uh, you know, if there's a, an abundance of uh, honey locusts, you know, you're going to see them mainly on the honey locusts, you know. So it depends on what's uh, blooming at that time, too, I think. And, and speaking of that, uh, folks, uh, just so you're aware, there are certain species uh, of uh, whether it be butterflies or bees or any of the other pollinators that look that are plant specific. Uh, typically, the mason and leaf cutter that we're going to kind of focus on 
is not. It, it's a generalist in terms of pollination, a uh, uh, plant, plant selection. But there is an alfalfa uh, uh, solitary bee. So uh, I've been curious to try to put out a house uh, in an alfalfa fetus to see if I, I'm able to uh, collect any alfalfa particular species. Uh, this this slide here, you know, you, we've talked a little bit about identification. I've pointed out a lot of times when you get down to the species level that you need a uh, that you need a microscope to get down to the species level. But when you deal on the order level, like I mentioned, um, bees are in the hymenopter order, meaning they tip they have two two sets of wings. Uh, the diptera, which is the fly has one set of wings and then they have another uh they ha have another uh thing behind that set of wings called a halter and believe it or not uh this fly called the hover fly or it's i think sometimes called the cypress fly uh we when i did the national scout jamboree the one of the entomologists that i was working with uh, we constantly had a, a cypress fly that would, would show up. And sure enough, it, it looks so much like a bee. Uh, that's what a lot of the scouts, even including myself, uh, thought we were seeing. And then there's even some beetles, uh, the uh, colonoptera order, that try to mimic uh, the bee. And you find that also in, you know, the, the butterfly. There's, you know... The monarch has uh, a number of, of insects that um, that mimic it. Okay, this I uh, again kind of pointing out there at least uh, again that they're native, uh, unlike the honeybee. There's about 300 species of of solitary bees, and we've mentioned a few. You know the uh, the leafcutter and mason are the ones I'm kind of focusing a little bit on, and uh, I want to make a plug about the carpenter bee a little bit. Uh, you know, if anybody on here knows of a house that fell down because of carpenter bees, uh, please let me know because I'm not aware of them. And I think uh, I'm now a big advocate that we need to you know, make sure we paint, paint over things. As we continue to remove habitat of... Uh, in, in, in society, and I, you know, and I'm not... Uh, I've got a, I called, uh, <laughs> I called the, uh, trade, uh, not federal trade committee. I called the, uh, utility people at the state on AP. They stuck a note on my door, said they were going to cut down trees and said, well, the first time the guy came to my door and he said, we're going to cut trees down. I said, well, what are you going to put back on there on the power line? He said, nothing. I said, well, no, you're not cutting trees down. And then uh, next thing I know, they start sticking notes on my door and they had a number on there to call. Well, I call the number and it doesn't answer. So I called the, uh, all the utilities I'll shoot. People that regulate AEP and gas and all that, trying to think of the state agent. I've had really good success with them. I used them over on Red House Hill one time when I tried to get some gravel in there that Columbia Gas has a right of way in there by that uh, trail there that I had my scouts working on. So uh, we couldn't get in there. So I called them and sure enough, uh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't mountain gas, but anyhow, I, I'm making a plug for that at state agency. They will, uh, they will get some action from AEP or Mountaineer gas or who, I think it was union gas that had that right away. So, uh, so that's my, I want to make a plug about, you know, carbon or, bees if possible you know leave put something out there for them to, to eat up and paint your stuff that's put some siding on stuff and so on uh, don't eliminate another pollinator he, he may not be as a, a big player like some of the others but he is a player in the pollination game those are my scouts over there we've kind of focused uh, our effort on putting solitary bee nests out in uh the Toyota plant area there. Uh, I don't know if any of you were involved with that with the USDA when they first put that in, but uh, I yeah. was. 
Was he Clint? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I was too with uh, the Master Natural program. We we were over there, but uh, our scouts and uh, you'll and I'll show you all here when we get into the habitat, the houses they built, and uh, we did get uh, we did get some uh, mason bees. I've got them. So uh, now the houses we build did not would not last uh, more than just through the through that sixty day season. Okay. All right. Here's here's you a photo of the mason bee. I wish I would have when I did these photos like this. I needed to be able to show for you kind of the the size of the bee. It's it's uh, it's it's very small compared to your honey bee. And uh, here's the leaf cutter. Oh, let me back up. Let me point out the difference between the mason bee and the leaf cutter is that the mason bee, uh, when they fill their house, they build their little, and I'll, and I'll show you here shortly about that, how they they fill their little house up with their uh, with their babies, you know, uh, and uh, with their eggs, they they uh, they space theirs out and clog their hole with mud. And I'll show you one that I purchased. And uh, now the leaf cutter, it does the opposite. It uses uh, leaves to fill its hole. And there's picture one doing that. Typically, and we'll get into this again. Typically, the mason bees come out around April, maybe depending on the weather when it hits, but they'll come out around, you know, maybe late March, early April, and they'll be gone by July. Then that's when we see our leaf cutter bees come out and they'll stay out for about 60 days. And pretty much all of our solitary bees will be somewhere uh in a in a uh, habitat uh until the spring again uh as i pointed out this is just a, a slide from the people that i have learned from is a gentleman that owns the business called crown b and this is from his book where he kind of points to the fact that your solitary bee which is on the left its whole body is full of pollen. And as you beekeepers know, your honeybee only puts its pollen on, it, on its legs. Again, this is from that book from uh, Crown Bee. Uh, the key when we build a habitat is to have it at least 200 uh, feet away uh, in proximity to a pollinating garden. And of course you need some water. Every insect needs water. So having the access to water, I've seen people that in the Mason bee business kind of make sure that some of the soil that they have is loose, that they can mix, you know, that the bee can mix the, the water and the soil together to make, uh, you know, if you got a little mud, keep, some keep a little mud hole, hole going around their pollinator garden so that they can uh, use that to fill the hole. And of course, I think you beekeepers know that anything you can do to make it easier on the bee, the better it saves energy. Uh, at least that's what I'm learning from you honeybee people. When we got somebody else that needs to enter. Uh, again, you guys, some of you beekeepers, Phil, jump, jump in there, but that's my understanding. You guys have to, you know, when your stronger hives are when you start when you start out with a with a frame that maybe has, uh, you know, some of that uh, the wire and stuff, you know, versus just simply having a frame that you shove in there. So anything that we can do to help to uh, you know, that the, their energy is more towards, you know, reproduction and, and so on, the better. Uh, so this slide here, I'm giving you a few minutes to look at it. I will tell you this on, on my presentation. I have the permission from them to use this in my talk, 
I'm not quite comfortable sharing my slides that have uh, these pictures of the books in there because uh, towards the end here, one of the re the two books I'm going to recommend to you uh, would be the, the gentleman from Crown B. I, I have talked with him. I was hoping to work a deal with him where my scouts could uh, make some money uh, harvesting uh, uh, solitary bees and selling them back to him. He does have a program, and some of these solitary bee folks do, where if you uh, remove the uh, habitat in, say, September, you remove the cocoons, you clean them up, package them up and send them back to you, send them back to you, they will compensate you for that because they turn around and sell them. Uh, I haven't looked at the profitability with it. Unfortunately, when I started with him, I had Zoom meetings with him. And uh, for whatever reason, I can't seem to get him to reply to me anymore. So uh, I, I moved on to, to something else on that. Okay, now we're talking, we're jumping in a little bit. We hit a little bit about nesting materials. So we're going to look at some ideas of what makes a good nesting material and what doesn't. And, and I'll show you here in a second the particular size. Uh, paper uh, is inexpensive. I'm going to show you some paper straws that you can get from Walmart. And basically, you're looking at three cents each for it's six ninety nine for for two hundred from the gentleman from Mason Bees, and I'll show you a, a picture here in a minute of those. I paid thirty two cents for each for two hundred and fifty of them. So uh, there's you can take uh, you you can take parchment paper, roll it around a pencil, tape it, and make your own. And again, I'm going to show some more pictures where this will all I'll pull in together for you. But uh, for three cents each, paper straws are kind of, a, to me, a good deal. What you want to stay away from is bamboo because they can't breathe in bamboo. Uh, drilling blocks of wood and so on. The and again, I'm going to show you a picture here in a minute why I'm going to give you this information about six inches. Your tube or your hole needs to be at least six inches deep. Typically, that again, every female is a queen. So when she finds that nesting spot, she starts in there with females and she starts laying females up until like the last spot. And then she'll put a, be a male there. Then she'll cover her hole, and then unfortunately she'll die. Uh, but uh, so you need that length of of six inches so that you can have that male. If she comes out, she's not she doesn't have a tape measure, and so she's not going to fly in that hole and measure out. If if it ends up that uh, all you get is females, then you're going to be real challenged with. Uh, with having a reoccurring. Okay, here's again, this so is, is that real quick. Is that a six inch minimum? They can be deeper than six inches. They can uh, just remember one end has to be blocked. Clint, now she'll, she'll block the other end, but just remember she'll uh, block uh, it, that that end needs to be blocked. Gotcha. I don't think I don't know I don't know the research on whether if it's longer like seven inches will you get more bees. I, I I don't know that research for you. Now you have to be this this again is from the gentleman from Crown B. I am very impressed with him. I'm disappointed he didn't call me back about the scout stuff, but I am very impressed with uh, his book and the research. There are two people that I like, and, and I'm going to introduce one, the other one here shortly when it comes to your research. And I, and uh, in the four years that I've been studying this particular insect, uh, I've watched 
quite a few videos. In fact, I watched one this morning, which I started, you know, when you get to a certain point, particularly after you read people that, and then worked with people like I'm fortunate to work with an entomologist uh, on some things, you, you start learning, well, you know, uh, that's not, that's not quite true. Like she, this morning, she was this one YouTube video I was watching, they were putting the bumblebee in the same family as the carpenter bee. Well, that's not true. A bumblebee is a social insect, not whereas the carpenter bee is a solitary insect. And by the way, a bumblebee, what's kind of curious about them, they do a pollination. Uh, they, they are kind of plant specific pollinators. Bumblebees are. They do kind of a, uh, I'm blocking the official scientific term, but they basically shape the pollen out of the out of the plant, whereas you know our uh, my mason and leaf cutter bees, uh, they just basically you know uh, refrigerator perry kind of the uh, the the uh, plant. So this again is from uh, uh, Dave Hunter's book on mason bees, and uh, he gives you kind of a timeline. And, and when you would expect to see, again, this is all depending on temperatures. And as we know with the way our climate is changing, you, you almost, you can't almost go by the calendars anymore. You, you kind of look at, uh, at the, uh, at the temperature. I was talking to, well, Barry's online and I was talking to another beekeeper uh, person in the hurricane area. And she's worried about her bees because of the way the temperature's been. She's afraid they're going to, because they're, they've they spent, again, this back to my point about whatever we can do, whether it's mud mud pools or something for these bees, to for them to save energy. She's afraid they've expanded their energy and she's her hives are so frozen, she can't get in there to put a, a food source for, to improve them. Don, we've got another person coming in, a uh, Sarah Roach. So I'm going to go ahead and admit her. Okay. Well, anybody, like, again, please feel free to jump in here. Some of you honeybee experts, if you've got any other comments on those tidbits I'm bringing out. I'm looking, let me see. Do I need to look anything on the chat line there, Don? Are we okay with? Uh, no, I, th I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, you okay. did say well, that you were going to share the book resources, right? Yes, I am. I am. Okay. Because I, I had a question about that, but. Um, and we're going to go ahead. I also had a question. So you mentioned um, not using bamboo. And I know a lot of like, as even in the picture you've got here, you know, a lot of solitary houses use bamboo. They do. So, um, like, that's not a recommendation because that seems to be like everybody's kind of go to. They apparently don't breathe in there, which and it's would make hard, sense. And it's going to be hard to get those for three cents each to get paper straws. I mean, you you can't. It's be. so much better, right? Now, let me share with you a controversy, and I'm sure there's controversies. I, I was talking to my mentor yesterday about uh, some things and uh, I asked him about this particular controversy there this lady Heather Holmes who I'm going to recommend her book to you um, and we'll see a short video on her she is pretty adamant that if you're not going to take your bee house down like I did with well the ones for the scouts were made out of uh cardboard that we got from uh tower mountain spring water and i'll show you pictures i'll show you those here in a little bit when we get into the particular houses and uh of course they got wet and so they weren't any good anyhow but i had intended period in september which i did i collected up what we uh what tubes that were full and we did we did also some bamboo and i don't I do not recall seeing any of the bamboo full of anything, whereas our paper straws were. Uh, and so uh, this, the controversy is the, and one of the designs I'm gonna, 
I have available for you to download. Or if we, when we do decide to bring the, do the workshop, I will bring a model in. Well, I've got a model to show you today, but anyhow, we can touch it and see it more close up. So the gentleman that, that teaches our program for the Master Naturalist, uh, Steve Wellheimer, Steve makes, Steve's of the opinion that just leave them up. Well, Heather and others have decided that based on uh, their work and even this uh, Dave Hunter with Crown B, of course, he's in the commercial business. <laughs> so uh, you, you have to always, you know, ask what's your conflict. And so, uh, but Heather and Dave and a number of others say that you're just putting out eat here sign. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you're asking for predators. You're asking for parasitic predators. And once you invite them into uh, your uh, bee house, then they're going to continue to come and eat there, continue to. And so your population will eventually just uh, die out. So Heather's of the opinion, if you're not going to put the work into it, don't do it. Nature, and I'll show you some nature ways that uh, that they already pretty much, they're there. That's the other thing I think uh, Mr. Hunter got distracted on. He did share with me that, uh, you know, he sells and I bought some from him and I'll show you those here in a little bit. But, uh, you know, if you put up the house, they're going to populate it. And so I think that kind of, uh, you know, uh, deflated him a little bit. Uh, I, I personally think my opinion is uh, we need the habitats up. I think you should take the time to take them down, whether you clean the tubes out and and remove the cocoons. I'm not sure that's, that's important if you get them down uh, soon enough and then you put them back up you know, put them in your garage, put them somewhere where you can access them come the springtime. But uh, let me see, let me stop the share on my video, you know, it just. Uh, so when did you say that you would take them down and put them back up? I, I would take them down about September and put them back up on, in uh, uh, about March. the middle of March. Yeah. yeah. So let me show you this this video. This is this is going to be the YouTube video that I've had in my final thing for you as a recommendation for well in my reference for you. Let me get into the sc share screen again. And by the way, this Heather Holmes lady that uh, I'm going to show you this video on. I have communicated with her. If you get on, there's an app called iNaturalist. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but iNaturalist is, it's a free app. It's through, there was a university that started it. I think the American, uh, some other scientific organization has taken it over, but basically uh, you can, and I'll show you maybe a video, I mean, show you my iNaturalist. It, it's, it's with you, um, National Geographic in uh, California. Um, right. A lot of Californians who has that now. But you can pretty much get uh, a sense of where, you know, uh, if you take a picture of an insect and you're unsure of what it is, uh, you know, some people come on there and identify, help you to identify it. And uh, Heather is probably one of the ones that, is is recognized for bees. So I'm, this is kind of a short video, just so you hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, about her opinion about you know, do you leave them up? Do you don't? I mean, treaties rather than constructed supplemental nests made by humans. Um, Oops, sorry about that. Whoops, Oop, my internet didn't go out. plant list as well. I might have to back up here a little bit. Okay. Look like, but as, as a starting point, I would look for um, sort of what I 
show, I showed in that picture of the agapostum and nest. So the, the hole uh, smaller than the diameter of a pencil with a, a sort of a round tumulus or soil mound around it. And I forgot uh, no. the second uh, part of your question. Foot traffic. Yeah, foot traffic. Yeah. <laughs> so with solitary species, there's really no concern about um, stinging. And I, I would imagine that's what the question is related to. Um, the solitary females aren't interested in defending their nest. Again, they're, they're busy trying to get their life's work done in a very short period of time. So you can sit next to solitary nests, whether it's a bee or a wasp. Um, observe and and watch their activities, and um, that you're not going you're not going to get stung. So, um, there were a couple questions about uh, choosing plants, whether that's for shade or sun, or that offer nectar or pollen through the seed. So, she's kind of my go-to person, and again, I'll I'll have a a link for you on that on that video. If you're going to watch one video, it's going to, in my opinion, it would be hers. And, and this is one of, this is a photo out of her book about, and what she was getting ready to talk about in terms of uh, the nature provides a lot of habitat. The picture there on the right with the penny on it, that's on my property. And that was about two years ago. And it's in an area that uh, what I did is uh, of course I've got a small excavator and I dug a hole and I put a uh, one of those uh, containers that hospitals use uh, for iodine and other things and I filled it full of water and uh, allow rainwater to 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 go in there. And I took an old pump and I keep water in in kind of a bucket so to speak, a big old tub there. So the bees have access to a water source. And, uh, but these are ground nesting bees and see how they burrow that. When I first saw it, initial thought was, well, there's a, we got crawled ads or something, you know, but, but it's such a small hole as you can see from the penny. Uh, Heather points out again about, you know, again, if you're not going to take your nest down, uh, clean them out and, uh, She's saying, just let nature, and here's some examples of where the mason bees uh, filled uh, old rotted tree, tree stumps or trees and so on. And even uh, stalk, flower stalks, they'll, they'll use those. Uh, Jerry, I have a question. We, do you mind to go back two slides? Okay. Uh, I I would thought um, that maybe you could explain or talk about what's happening in the ugly picture here. So you have like, you know, what's a good hive? Maybe that's that bamboo hive is the bad hive because I can clearly see that's a store-bought one I've seen in stores. But what's happening in that ugly picture with that particular bee? It, it, there's some type of parasite that's attacking that bee. So is that from not having proper habitat or is that just something that's naturally occurring? That's because you haven't removed, uh, you know, the, uh, if it's a, it's a, if it's a, uh, a house that's been left up there, then there are predators that will come out, um, uh, when when March comes, you know when when the bees and, and start attacking uh, the others. Sure. So they just go in and take up residence. Um, so in your comments from her, basically, you're she's saying that if you're not going to take care of them, then just let nature do its thing, and right. as opposed to providing that extra. Um, opportunity for you know those predatory things to happen is that right okay right. you know it's uh the nature ones are probably going to be more difficult for for parasites to find sure. now there are serious um, i'm glad you asked to bring this back back to our honeybee people there are solitary bee folks that don't like our honeybee guys that are on here and the reason why is 
your honeybees are going to travel uh plant day what about and and very uh up to five miles or so so they're going to be going out and finding i don't use pesticides typically uh, so they're going to get into <coughs> pesticides and you're going to bring them back to my mason and, and leaf cutter bees so uh you know there's some controversy going on there with with respects to that but i did uh, have that question um and um in conjunction with the projects that we're working on for that simple reason um you know certain bees travel further than others and you do have those opportunities to bring back things and introduce things into other areas that maybe wouldn't have been there so is that something that we should think about a little bit further as we're building our um you know, bee yard for the honeybees. I mean, do you think putting some of these solitary bee habitats close to those honeybee boxes is going to be a good idea? Just like what Heather says, if you're expecting to leave it and not monitor it and, and maintain it, then uh, let nature take its course. Don't do anything. But my assumption is you folks are planning on doing maintenance and maintaining. So of course, sure. That, that's the key. You just got to, I mean, our beekeepers that are on here, you don't just, somebody share, how often do you check your hives? Well, okay. I apologize. I just had a phone call. So I probably missed a little bit of what y'all were talking about, but uh, you know, you were talking about the ugly bee there a while ago. I was getting ready to tap in when I got the phone call. But, uh, you know, in, you know, honeybees, we have what we call the varroa mite. And they, uh, you know, produce and, and do all their stuff inside the, um, uh, the, the brood itself. So I would say that, you know, um, because you're not cleaning those tubes and stuff, you know, that's where they germinate from is in that, uh, uh, in those old hives or as in those old brood nests. So, um, but uh, like I said, I was going to jump in there before I got the phone call and then I got messed up. So, Dave, how often are you guys, how often are you and Clint checking your, uh, you know, during this time period and, and then when your honey season, when you're, when it comes during, during this time of year, you know, you don't want to break the, uh, the, the cluster that they're in, uh, you know, they sit there and they actually, you know, cluster up and they, uh, that's how they keep themselves warm. And, uh, you know, so this time of year, you really don't want to break into them, but come springtime, uh, Clint will probably what be into them about once, uh, about every seven to 10 days. And you're yeah. always checking, am I not correct? You're always checking for parasites or other, yes. other health issues to the bee. You just don't simply, you know, no, no, enough and say, well, you know, go good guy, good luck guys. You're right. Yeah. No, we're, we're constantly, uh, like I said, bromite is, uh, you know, uh, has been a big deal for the last about 20 years. And, uh, you know, so we'll do a varroa mite check on them um, early spring and, you know, see see how they came out of the winter. Uh, we did most of our treating and stuff in the fall and during the winter months when there is no brood, that way you can pretty much wipe the colony out or, the, you know, the varroa mite out. And you um, even have to watch the queen, don't you? You have to monitor her health and so on, whereas, you know, with us, well, I'm, I'm saying us. My solitary bees, you know, uh, every one of them is a queen, but you you can't, uh, you know, you have to be sensitive to the fact that, as I understand it, with uh, the queen's court, so to speak, they can kind of make a decision whether she dies or lives or goes off and creates another hive. So yeah, yeah sure. there's a lot of there's a lot of work to beekeeping. It's not just simply uh, see one done one, you know. And I think it has a lot to do with the type of uh, hive you have. Uh, like Steve, for example, he uses horizontal type hives. And, you know, and, and some beekeepers, like 
we do treat, but we don't treat like a lot of beekeepers treat. Um, I know Steve is a no treater. And so I think there's a lot of variables when it comes to honey beekeeping as well, just because of, of the nature of the beast. So um, as far as getting in them, I know Steve probably gets in his probably less than we do just because of the style of the hive. So. Right, right. Uh, the Layens horizontal hive, uh, we're treatment free, never treated, ever treated a bee one time. We don't feed them. And uh, we'll get in those hives maybe six times a year. And two of those times are to harvest honey. Uh, so when I closed them up in October, I won't I won't touch them again until oh probably middle of March, something like that. Uh, they just take care of themselves. The the style of the hive, there's plenty of honey left in the in the hive for the winter, and so we don't have to even bother with them. Uh, Steve, is there a specific uh, honey bee, the Russian or the uh, what's the the well, uh, which one? does uh, in the horizontal hive well i can't answer that question and it's that's it's an interesting question and the reason i can't ask answer that specifically is because if we catch if we have bees in our house they're bees that we have caught off of large tracts of woodlands okay and so they're quote unquote feral bees that have you know survived for years, you know, out in the woods by themselves in bee trees. Oh, okay. And so when okay. we bring bees, yeah, we'll have we'll have black bees and yellow bees and uh, gray bees and all kinds of different combinations of bees. We'll have black queens and red queens and yellow queens and hmm. and uh, so it's I can't answer that specifically. And because because of the various types of bees that we have, uh, my opinion is, and 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 the people that have done a lot of research on this, the experts uh, all say that that adds to the survivability of of the of these kind of hives and these kinds of bees because they're not one particular kind of bee; they're they're, they're crossbred, but with all kinds of stuff. So so anyway. But I do have a question about okay. about solitary beehives, and you talk about maintaining them, and 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 watching them, and and how uh, honeybees may bring back disease to them. Uh, if if the solitary bees don't have a social nest like a like our honeybee hives, uh, how are we going to contaminate them? except for that maybe their our bees are bringing back uh, pesticides or something to the area uh, that the solitary bees may go out and pollinate. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, how do you maintain these hives? Well, the, uh, to answer your first question, I just brought that up as uh, the issue of the, the honeybee uh, issue from a video I watched from, and I don't, uh, in talking with my mentor on some of this, there's not good research yet on any of this in terms of even how, uh, you know, whether it's, it's good just to leave them or it's best to bring, you know, the hives in uh, or bring the, uh, to bring the tubes in, uh, there's not good research yet on that. So, I'm, I'm just giving you a controversial thing. From my perspective, I brought the tubes in. I did not take the tubes apart to see uh, if uh, uh, with, with the cocoons in, to take the cocoons out. And as I mentioned, the guy from Crown Bee, uh, if you get into his kind of work with it, uh, they do buy back the cocoons. Uh, they don't buy back the tubes with the the mason or leaf cutter, but they'll you know they'll have a program with you. So again, this is just a controversy I bring to you 
is there a right answer? It's just like my mentor yesterday was talking to me about, there's even people out there say, don't feed your birds because you're increasing the number of birds that are going to survive this winter. So eventually if you don't, you stop feeding them, you know, you're, you're, you've created a problem because then you've created more birds in the area that there's fewer habitat, fewer insects to eat. So there's always controversy on things. So you just have to do, I, I feed my birds. We enjoy watching them. So with my solitary bees that I've started projects with, with scouts, I'm going to collect them up in September. Am I going to pull the tubes apart and clean them and stuff like uh, the guy from Crown Bee? Not at this point, I'm not. Uh, I need to see some more research on that aspect of it. But uh, anyhow. Yeah, so it's it's like the old adage: if you had, gather up ten beekeepers and you ask them the same question, you'll get twelve answers. Yeah, I always so, like Harry. I like Harry Truman, President Captain Harry Truman's famous saying when he was pre, uh, when he was president: if you get if if you give all if you line all the economists in the world around the equator and ask them a question, they'd each point in a different direction. Yeah, <laughs> so there's yeah, everybody's got an opinion on that. My yeah. It makes sense to me to take them down and, uh, you know, just like with my bird feeders, we, we clean them out, you know, and so I, I, I clean my houses out to put back up. So, okay, let me, let me jump back. Okay, so uh, there was a question someone asked about which bee is better. Uh, my recommendation when you build uh, your house to do multiple go for the you know go for all of it and here is the typical size diameter holes that you see for the various bees again I would uh, I don't have any research on some of these whether all of them have to be six inches but I'd play it safe and make them all six inches and I'm going to show you some tools here in a minute based on my trial and error with uh with making one when we get into looking at specific habit, the specific habitat that uh, that Steve Wellheimer from uh, our Master Naturals program. Now on the right side there, this is the tubes that I was telling you about that I got from uh, Crown B, and those were thirty two cents each, and you can see there it's uh, the the uh, interior uh, and, and the diameter in there just a little less than a quarter of an you know quarter and uh and the length there on that i've got my ruler down there a little bit over six inches okay so what is that made out of again are those the uh, paper tubes that is a that's not the paper that is like a it's not bamboo I was like, it's, it looks suspiciously like bamboo. That's why I was asking. Yeah, it does look like bamboo, but it's like a stalk. Remember yeah, in okay. the, video, the yes. picture from Heather, she suggested cutting some of your uh, plants off, you know, at the stalk level. So that's what. So they finally found a good use for cardboard straws is what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh I, here's, here's the ones that I like in terms of, uh, I, I do like the model that Steve uh, set up. And I had a friend of mine look at um, making me a jig. Uh, Gerald Vance, who's just an amazing woodworker, uh, had a, he has a PBS series called the Appalachian Woodworker. He lives over here on uh, uh Middle Creek in, in Putnam County. It's Putnam's Cabell slash. Uh, and uh, I, I gave the project to Gerald and I said, here was Steve's design. Can you simplify this for the average woodworker? And he came up with a, a router table model. And let me see if I can play the video with, with Gerald showing you how that works. can sit Oops. next to solitary nests whether it's well i guess that won't work like that 
I'll have to go in here. See what we're doing on time. Does anybody, does anybody need a break? Or are we okay? Just keep going on. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Okay. This is the jig that Gerald made for me for uh, creating the the uh, the groove like deal. What he's done here, um, I'm going to hover over it, but he's put a probably about a quarter inch uh, uh, a bit there. I don't know if you can see my little arrow, and then he's cut uh, spacing boards so that he can, as he makes that one groove, he can take out a spacing board, move his fence back, make the next groove and so on. Uh, when uh, a carpenter friend of mine, we worked on the, the Steve design. Uh, it took us, it took us four hours uh, to make one. And, uh, but now, you know, uh, now that we've made one, we probably, you know, can make them in a little bit, you know, faster approach, but, uh, the challenge we had was with, with the drill bit and, 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 uh, and I'll get, I'll get to that. You can Google and come up with some solitary bee houses. I'm not going to jump in that. I want to jump here for you. Okay, this is a nesting cavity that I was telling you about, about the six inches. So again, I hope you can see my uh, my little pointer, so to speak. So they're gonna they're gonna lay, they're gonna put and cap off one end, and then they're going to start putting their eggs in there, and they're gonna put in their. Uh, I'll shoot you, honeybee folks. So uh, what's it's. Uh, What's the food called? <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking on the word. It's the same type of food you guys see your bees bring in for... for uh, Is it bee bread? Bee bread, thank you. I don't know why I couldn't think of bee bread. But anyhow, so then they plug. And like I mentioned, probably the last, towards the last tube is going to be the male. And the male is going to dig himself out first. And then the females... Uh, We'll start digging, digging their way out of the tube. And let's see. So I see if you can see this. I bought these from Crown uh, Bees. I got uh, 40. So there's supposed to be 40 bees, not in this one. There's 20 in this, and I've got another one uh, like this. And that cost me $14.95. Now, my mentor, <clears throat> I told you about I have for entomology, he, he kind of shakes his head when I do stuff like that because he's not big about buying or bringing in insects from other places unless he's comfortable that that person has a quality assurance. These people that sell uh, solitary bees are usually in Utah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And I find that they uh, buy their buy their bees from uh, from uh, Canada. They get many of theirs from Canada. But now, like I said, the Crown Bee guy has a buyback program with uh, with some of the people he works with. Okay, this is the model that Steve uh, made, and I and I've got one here to show you in that we put together. And this is the one I'm telling you that we started about uh, one o'clock and reading the plans and everything. And it took us till about uh, four o'clock before we actually had. So it took us about three hours. We had a, uh, a, a one constructed. Another thing I, I, I haven't pointed out is uh, where to locate these. And I think it was in one of the other slides with the crown bee stuff, but they're best on the Southeast. They're best when it's put at least five to six feet 
above uh, above the ground. And uh, so it so happens with the drill bit. Let me get the drill bit. So initially, I purchased this type of bit. I don't know, can everybody see that? It's a supposed to be fast cleaning, to... fast cleaning wood, uh, Diablo. Okay. You might have to unshare your screen and show that because um, okay. you're just in that little, there you go. Can you see that one? How about that? Is that? I think it's I still on your, it's in more... your screen blur. There you go. Right. Yeah. Like kind of in front of your, kind of in front of your face. There you go. Okay. Yeah. I got to put it in front of my face. Okay. So I went with that and we struggled trying to drill those. What we did is we put, we clamped all the, all the pieces of wood together. These are one by sixes and We clamp those all together. I've got one with a straw in it to show you that a straw will fit in that. So that's a quarter inch hole. This is one of Steve's, okay, model. So we have uh, three one by sixes, or excuse me, two by sixes, and then one one by six on the end. And then we've drilled, there are, uh, there are 11, uh, columns of holes and uh, they're drilled so that they're in between where the wood comes together so that if you decide to clean well he's a member Steve points out uh, to leave it up but I, I prefer taking it down so you take the, if you take these uh, six screws out you can remove the back and you can remove your tubes. It does fit perfectly with those Walmart straws I was telling you about. I don't know if you can see that. Can I hadn't cut that one off so that you could see that it does fit in that one quarter hole. So in my opinion, this is probably the, the Cadillac of, of solitary bee houses. Now, what's that gonna cost you to put together? Uh, I, I need to figure that out. But Steve charges at our workshops $35 to, to make them. Now, I don't think he charges any labor. I think that's pure, pure uh, the material cost. So I haven't calculated out my, my total cost yet. And I've got into just one of these. I so did, what, are the, what, materi ahead. what materials are you calculating in the cost? Because you have the two by sixes. Um, and then, you know, that'd be like one, two by six plus what other materials? Uh, there's a uh, bit. There is a, uh, there's a one by six. There is a, uh, for the top, you've got a, uh, and top and side, or excuse me, for the top, you've got a, uh, a, uh, one by eight. And for the side, you've got a one by uh, a one by six, I believe, is the side. I have to pull up the plan. So um, you're going to share that plan, um, I think. But if you were to buy those materials, you'd buy them at length, and then you could make multiple houses, you That's know, out correct. of that same length. So it wouldn't necessarily be that you're actually going to have $35 tied up in one house. You can make multiple houses maybe with those same materials. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think a, I think what I paid for a two by six and the way we cut it, we could possibly get, it was a 12 footer. We could possibly get three houses out of it was a little over ten dollars for that and then i uh then i had to buy like say two more boards i had to get a uh a one by uh a one by eight and a one by six and again i think those 
I was trying to think what I paid for those boards and so on. But the, you know, it 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 takes time once you cut it. Steve had everything cut and ready for the workshop so that the student could go ahead and uh, and drill the holes in, in the center. Uh, and again, we, we, we got into kind of a challenge with that, the holes in the center. We started out on my drill press, putting them, and then we ended up using a longer drill bit to get all the way through that that hole so uh now i i i didn't see the well we can go back and look at the final project that one of our classmates did whether she put uh holes all the way through or not but let's see but so could you potentially just drill those at a six inch depth or do you have that drilled and then you put a back on it like you made because you're cutting that um <clears throat> basically on the side of each of those boards where they join so right. you would cut that all the way through and then just put a back on it right yes yeah okay she only did let's see three she only did nine she only did nine rows uh, nine rows with or or nine column is it? Let's see, three columns with nine in it in there. That would be. Is that a personal preference? In terms of number, yeah, it's just personal. Yeah. Now you know, again, back to my hole diagram. You know, y it's nice to have different size size holes. So this is to me is kind of the Cadillac. the The other approach is I'm on that slide there is is the tubes i was mentioning to you that's this is uh this is what i call a b hotel here and the purpose of it is once you hang it up the six foot and so on you would be able to remove your houses there so you can see i took a piece of cedar and i drilled holes in it i was getting ready to fill this tube here the tubes on the top, what I did with those tubes on the top is I filled those with sawdust and closed those off. And then I put things like uh, cone, honey cones or pine cones and different things. There are solitary bee folks that uh, recognize that the solitary bee typically uses landmarks to navigate. Uh, and so if it picks up and knows that my house is above below this pine cone and then I know I'm headed in the right direction towards where, where I need to go. Uh, there's also folks that believe the color purple. If you paint a little purple on your house, it is uh, a, a color that the... Uh, solitary bees or even I think honeybee any insect picks up and, and knows to uh, it is a, uh, a a a sign or a road sign for them that you know here, here's where possibly my house is at so uh let me stop sharing again so over here I showed you so this is the tubes so you could put you could put your, these again are some of the ones from uh, Mason Bees. You can put your straws in there. And, and some people put like, a log, or, I mean, a piece of wood or brick or various things in there and as a way, again, for navigation kind of direction. So you would fill that up, tip, you could, can fill it up with, with, with a different habitat or with things that help them to direct towards uh, this area. Now, again, this was cardboard, so I had to take these down because the weather, even though I kind of 
painted them with some, uh, uh, I'll shoot uh, shellac. Uh, it, they still, you know, they still are going to get wet, cold, and need to be removed. And as I mentioned, that's kind of my preference is to move them, take them down in September, and then put them back up in, in the March time period. So, Steve, I, I think David probably told you our story about being called out to what the gentleman thought was a swarm of honeybees in his woodshed. And when we got there, I'm, you know, looking at him, I said, these are the cutest little honeybees I've ever seen in my life. Come to find out they were the mason bees that he brought you, right? Yeah. But, I mean, this woodshed was just a huge woodshed, and David could, will have to tell you what type of wood was in there that they liked. But, uh, I mean, they were just in every daggone piece of wood that the guy had. Huh. And I mean, they were flying down in, you know, in and around. And, you know, we were actually looking for a hive of honeybees and come to find out they weren't right. So uh, I'm assuming that you can pretty much use whatever type of wood you want or whatever type of layout you want or whatever. Right. Because this was like a what, David, like an eight by eight building that was had all this wood stacked in it. Yeah, I, I want to say it was Huckleberry. Is that what it was? Um, I just no, remember it was a Ma deep no, red no, wood. No, it was Mulberry. Mulberry. Yeah. A mulberry tree uh, that he had cut down. And it was um, that, uh, I, I guess we have a couple of those, that, that type of tree in our uh, vicinity. It was out there on Red House. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, it was just, I mean, every every one of those pieces of wood had you know they had bored a hole in and 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 it was just yeah it, there was a lot of bees there <laughs> mason bees yeah okay let me get back to my powerpoint let's see here okay so uh, let's see here. Uh, this is kind of a commercial time here for you. I think we got about thirty uh, about twenty eight minutes left. And uh, again, just to kind of, and I've got a little review here for us. Uh, you you got to have food, water, and shelter. And I'm making a plug for the West Virginia Wild Yard program. You know we're we're losing habitat. I think you're. Your children would enjoy that if they're responsible for mowing. You know, say so don't mow that anymore. Let's let uh, and it's you know what we've what I the people I work with the big advocate is the issue of plant native. You know, plant native plants and and it, to encourage native uh, insects. On this uh, particular house down here, I want I do want to point out that some people. I haven't done it, but some people, and I do have squirrels in my area, in, in my on my farm, but some, you know, have issues with uh, squirrels, so they provide, you know, like a a screen or something on their on their houses and so on. So, uh, and I'll have in in my thing here a link for you to be able to uh, download the information to the West Virginia Wild Yard. It doesn't cost you anything. My grand, uh, my grandson and I just, uh, I, I, I had him. We we laid out our our area for not only uh, birds and bees, but we also did uh, our our pond. We did a thing for bats because my son-in-law's for some reason uh, I'm not quite the uh, big animal person in the sense that I can tell you why why bats and and turkeys cohabitat together but for some reason they like each other but we've done that along with uh you know one of the biggest predators for mosquitoes is, is uh dragonflies uh dragonfly has a 95 percent kill ratio on mosquitoes so <clears throat> i've i've uh put things out <clears throat> it does on it does on honeybees too especially <laughs> queens <laughs> Yeah, especially queens during the mating season. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they don't habitat well together. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I, that's good to know because I won't put anything up or near my pond. Uh, so, 
Okay. Uh, if you are interested in this, one of the things that Barry and I learned, we went to our uh, Entomology Society conference this past January. There is a W researcher, um, a master's student in entomology. Her name is Nellie uh, Hitzman, H-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N. She's looking at a specific species of, uh, of mason bee and uh, she's going to provide people with them. The only request that she has is to be able to come and check them and pull down her, her research from them. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you are interested in helping her with that research and would like some, uh, I'm uh, just, you would just need to email me that, you know, your name and the location you would intend to, to place the, your your bee uh, house uh, again remember food shelter water and uh, this again is one of my reference books on that her particular uh, mason bee it's called the horn face bee and uh, this gives you again one of the reference books i like from heather holmes gives you a lot of good information about about uh, bees okay uh, I got a quiz. Uh, can't be a instructor without a quiz, right? So I got a 10 point quiz here for everybody. So, uh, the main difference between solitary bees and social bees. Can you, uh, let's see, can we, can you put Maybe, in, the chat? I was going to say, put it in your, put it in the chat or would you yeah. like us to answer? Yeah, put it in the chat for me so I can see. By the way, we won't make you go back to Paris Island if you fail this test. Okay, everybody's getting that one. Good. I've done my job. Yeah, that is correct. They do not produce honey. They're not aggressive, remember? Uh, they, they don't sting. So, great. Okay. Everybody see that one. What material do we not recommend? Man, I think everybody's got that one too. Great. And, and again, uh, to me, the, 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 uh, well, that one, uh, a, that one would be a and B probably the plastic straws are not going to be able to be, it's going to be the paper tubes or paper straws. So that one's kind of a. I was like, that was a trick question. I kind of went back and forth on that one for that reason. But since we talked about the bamboo, um, but because you wouldn't use plastic either, correct? It wouldn't be able to breathe, right? So, but anyhow, that was kind of a little bit tricky there. But so. Okay. This is from that uh, handout I told you that I really don't have permission to share. Uh, my slides from that perspective, but how many feet do we need to be from uh, the habitat to the pollination area? Okay, that one I need to probably cover a little bit. The answer is B on that one, 200 feet. So two to 300 feet, but uh, anyhow. They don't travel nearly as far as your, um, like honeybees do. So right, is that like kind of the minimum requirement? Cause they're, they're not going nearly as far. No, right. Okay. You know, remember I, we we talked about your honeybees are European, so right North America. That's a good one. Okay, I'm not sure how to do this chat thing, but yeah, <laughs> you can't from your <laughs> so you, okay. you you get a buy, you get a buy. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, you can just okay. shout out the answer and give us all the clues. <laughs> Come on, Dave. Okay, on this one here, okay. three days to what's their typical lifespan? 
That's correct. 60 days. They're usually about 60 day. So again, with the Mason bees, they're going to come out about early April, maybe late March. They're going to live about 60 days. Come July, we're going to see the uh, leaf cutters come out. By the way, on the young uh, researcher from WVU, I will be picking those bees up March the 10th. I'll be going to WVU to participate in their bug world. And so I'll have that. Now, here's my, uh, I think was somebody asked on, on, what they wanted to learn, why are they considered the super pollinators? So see if everybody remembers that. And that's correct. A hundred times more effective than honeybees in terms of pollination. And again, they're trying to remember them as the refrigerator Perry of, of uh, not good at math. <laughs> <clears throat> try to remember them as the refrigerator period of the of the pollinator they just when they hit that plant they just cover their whole body with it they're the muhammad ali of punch out uh, knockout <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> okay how can you distinguish a mason bee by from a Can I just yell it out? Yeah, you can do a shout out on that. El Mason B mud, right? Right, mud. Yeah. Okay. And then I mentioned about the preferred height is between five to six. Here you go, southeast. They want to get most of the morning sun. Again, back to that one chart that I got from Crown B with respects to having uh, the being sensitive to the temperature uh, so can okay. I participate again B <laughs> yeah there you go okay. Yep. And which of the following is not a solitary bee? Can so you go back to nine? Oh, okay. We answer nine. I thought we did. Uh, maybe I, I think I gave that one away, didn't I? I think I yeah, gave it. Well, so um, it's, you said earlier, like six, uh, five or six, or, you know, up to seven feet. The five to six, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, again, there are people out there that say three feet's fine, but uh, of course you're trying to attract, we're, we're talking about uh, mason bees and leaf cutter. Obviously, if it's a mining bee that I showed a picture of, they're going to, you know, they're going to bury themselves right in the ground. And some of Heather Holmes's, uh, you know, uh, houses were old tree stumps that fell down and, uh, you know, she drilled holes in it. Again, you're, the more, you know, habitat that you create and the variety it is a good thing. Just back to uh, uh, our gentleman that does the, uh, uh, does the horizontal uh, deal, the, you know, the whole mixture of the bees and stuff is, is a good thing. So Steve Arnett, Steve, Steve's comment about how with his type of, uh, be uh, uh, honey bee, honey bees that with the wild bees he's got Heinz fifty seven he's got every variety so just like with the uh, the solitary the more habit different types of habitat that you create so that answer kind of face that kind of answer goes with your mason and your leaf cutter bees they need to be between five to six feet off the ground so um. That brings up a question about, um, might be a, a dumb question, but just for clarification purposes, um, like you're talking about when the honeybees are all mixed in those horizontal hives, like they're crossbred. So the um, solitary bees, do they also 
Like, did they just cohabitate in those areas or did they also crossbreed? My understanding is they cohabitate in those areas. So but what I, happens with the honeybees? It's not that they, a uh, queen only mates one time in her life. And sure. so what happens is, is the, the, they're just feral bees. They're, they're bees that have been like, you have Russian bees, uh, you have Italian uh, carniola and all these different breeds that are out there and a lot of people try to keep them like i guess as uh true to that breed as they can and feral be when you ha when you let them naturally breed you don't have any control over that they, they will breed backwards and forwards and and you will have after let's just say last year my brother and i we bought a couple queens from a breeder and they were a specific breed well the next generation unless we artificially inseminate they're going to be a, a mutt of a bee we we don't know <laughs> what they bred with so you're going to get a big mixture of things so that that's what steve's bees are steve's bees and most of david and i's bees too are are feral bees that we've caught in swarm traps or went to somebody's house and got them out of their house or or whatever so that's that's the difference with those really and, and i'm not an evolutionary biologist so <laughs> i i can't you know totally answer your question don with respect to that but my understanding is typically that they, they don't they're not uh like but i would think that but, by nature they would probably not tend to cross breed that they would you know, just kind of cohabitate in those spaces. Yeah. And my final question. And I'm not going to ask you which of those does buzz pollination. If you remember me mentioning in that term, but that's the giveaway on that one. D, D is the answer yeah. to that. There you go. All righty. Well, that, wait a minute. Whoops, I'm sorry. I quit too soon without showing you, without showing you the references. I apologize. Let me, let me go back to my references. Okay. So uh, this is my favorite book by, uh, uh, Miss Holmes, it's called, uh, it's called, uh, Bees and Identification of Native Plant Foliage Guide. Just a great book. A lot of the pictures I showed you, particularly when we got to that, uh, Hornbee that's, uh, going to be available. Again, if you're interested in that, just email me. Uh, your location, and yes, I'm interested in participating in that WVU study, and this is where I'm going to put them. And uh, so, Jerry, with that study you mentioned, um, because I'd asked you previously about the requirements for that, so um, this I, she's going to want to be able to access that area where those bees are, correct? Be correct, to be able to yeah. check, right? So, like, you wouldn't want to be like, hey, I'm going to take some bees and just maybe put them in your backyard where you wouldn't necessarily want her to go. But if you guys have a place that you feel like you would offer her access to, then that would be the consideration. Right. And, you know, she's got to get so many. And she's driving from Morgantown. So uh, I'm not promising you you'll get them. I'm just going to provide her the names of people I've contacted. It'll be up to her to decide, yes, this person, I, I need some there and and so on. So, so what would be required of us um, to put them in the area? Like, is she asking for us to, you know, provide something specific or are we just going to kind of turn them loose? Is she giving us something to house them? Like, what does that look like? She's just giving you the bees. Okay. Because we, we talked about that previously, but just so that everybody has an understanding. Right. And then the other book that I've, uh, a lot of the references that I have is uh, Mason B. Revolution by uh, Dave Hunter. And Dave was the gentleman I mentioned to you. I 
had talked with. And the hyperlink there was that video I started for you about creating and managing habitat. There is when uh, plant uh, you, I don't know if you remember, but when we went to the pollinator at, at Toyota, the big book that they were pushing was attracting native pollinators. And that's by the Zurich Society. Yeah. Uh, and finally, you know, I, I mentioned, encourage you to look at the West Virginia Wild Yard. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it's just a neat little program, particularly if you got kids and grandkids to, and you don't, and you want an excuse not to mow all parts of your yard. Uh, just a nice little program to, to consider. And, but I, I can take some of those references out and share those slides. But like I said, I, I do want to cut those out before I share the slides since I don't have permission for you to have parts of those books for copyright reasons. So, and uh, we got it nine minutes left. Jerry, Jerry uh, real quick, can we go back to when we was talking about the, I, I think you opened up a can of worms there, about the co cross-contamination of, uh, you know, uh, that that type of thing. Um, it, I can't quote uh, who I read it, where I read it from or where I heard it from, okay? But um, in the state of West Virginia, uh, honeybees only pollinate like 20, 25% of anything that we have, you know, that uh, uh, that needs pollinated. Uh, the rest of them are, are native bees, uh, because right. we're more, we're more of a woodland type state. Now I would think that if it would uh, like if you're out the Midwest, you know, then you might start seeing some of that, you know, cross contamination. But I I, I can't see it here in the state of West Virginia. Uh, the again, you know, uh, Dave, on that, I'm just sharing with you some uh, rumor mill that I picked up off of some of my readings and some of the things I've, I've, I've studied there, like say there's one person that points uh, that that's concerned that uh, the honeybee is picking up uh, plants that have been uh, sprayed with uh, pesticides and so on and bringing back to, but you know, yeah, nobody, that Nobody's done a study on it, and, you know, it, it's just one of these things that, uh, is it going to concern me? No, I, I'm going to do my solitary bees, and, yeah. and I think, as you know, I'm hoping to have some honeybees for the purpose of, in my scout program, they have to, uh, there are two requirements that deal with specifically the honeybee, the social aspect of the honeybee, so... Uh, I bought an observation hive for just that purpose to to take around to the kids so they can see honeybees and so on. Now, of course, you know, they're quarter G. They've got an observation hive built into the side of that, that building. If you've never been there, it's kind of neat. Um, but a lot of my educational activity occurs at the Kanawha State Forest with the Master Naturals program. So, and... Uh, so I need I, I'm probably going to need a road show uh, there versus uh, trying to load them back up in the bus and take them over to quarter G. Okay, uh, I got one other question. Um, while you and Cade were out taking pictures uh, at that last uh, camp that you all were at, yeah, did you not tell me that you uh, and I thought I saw a picture of of a western bumblebee? I did. I think we did. Okay, um, is that native or has that come in from the West across the Mississippi? That's a good question. I, I didn't research that, Dave. Uh, uh, the bumblebee is supposed to be native, but I didn't research that particular one. And of course, you know, we were in Ohio when we were at summer camp. True, you know, true. We weren't in West Virginia when we when when Kate and I did our little trek around uh, the camp. Um, so I, I didn't know if there was, uh, you know, like all other things that are, you know, some are good, some are bad, but, uh, you know, we have lots of things creeping into our country that, you know, from 
uh, like those uh, uh, yellow legged uh, uh, or orange legged uh, hornets and stuff like that. I guess they're having problems with them down in South Carolina. Uh, the giant, the giant hornet come from China that you know from out west. I didn't know if that was just some one of one of the migrating things uh, or not, but uh, okay. You know the uh, uh, our lady. For those of you that are gardeners, uh, the native lady uh, lady beetle, the red black collar lady beetle, uh, it eats aphids. So, which you know, primarily impact on your on your plants and so on. Well, uh, in 1915, <laughs> USDA introduced the Asian lady. Book. Late lady beetle and it's now taken over and now it's considered a you know a pest and and impacting on our our native uh uh lady beetle mm -hmm. and, and of course the other pest that we have is the stink bug and yeah. now I, I saw in utah they're introducing what's called the samurai wasp <laughs> from right. asia to kill the stink bug and right. so we'll see how that works out hopefully and then of course you know i've been monitoring through iNaturalist the spotted lanternfly because uh i'm worried about my walnut trees and uh mm -hmm. and, and so uh of course the the, the spotted lanternfly again from asia is looking at uh, one of the host trees is the tree of heaven and, and so uh, our west virginia da is encouraging landowners remove tree of heaven off your property right. um so uh but i've been watching it. they do have it in the mongahelia forest and it has been spotted in harper's ferry it hasn't made it down our way yet but it's all over pennsylvania it's all over. I mean, there you can watch YouTube videos of people. They're telling you, you know, stomp on them. I mean, it's it's pretty. We it's, we had we as a truck driver, we had to take a uh, a class on how to uh, identify their nest and how to kill it. Yeah. Uh, because it's uh, they feel that that's the way it's uh, traveling. Because if you watch watch the migration of it, it's up and down major interstates. You know, like I eighty. You know, like, you know, 95, you know, it's starting to come down that way. And, yep. uh, you know, so we have had to, um, you know, take classes on how to identify, how to kill it, and, you know, and, and what to look for before we pick up, you know, uh, any trailers in those areas. So, but, okay, I'll back out of it and let somebody else talk then. Well, I'm looking at my list of questions. I think I've, I hit everybody's question that they were uh, wanting to get out of this again you know i'm happy to share my my slides but i will take out those uh those sections of that book and of course uh don's got it where well it's being recorded so yes the link, the well link. and i have i have a couple of questions just on points of clarification um or generalization but so um when we were talking about taking the hives down um, through the, you know, through the winter, I had a mm -hmm. couple of um, points of clarification on that. So one thing, um, you know, if you have a hotel that's a stationary hotel, that's a rather large hotel, um, you would not necessarily, unless you build it to be taken down, you wouldn't be able to like remove it and put it back up. So your hotel that you had, you're able to like remove all of the individual pieces that are built into it. Um, That's correct. If, if you had something that was more stationary and you're not able to do that, could you somehow cover, you know, even a small hive or a large hive, could you somehow cover those so that they would um, not become predatory um, in the early spring or, um, you know, would you just need to check it? and clean it out manually on site, like what would be your recommendation for that? Well, my recommendation from that would be not to do that. But, you know, again, like you say, uh, there's no research yet done on this. So this is my personal preference. Uh, my personal preference would be 
to remove the tubes, uh, store them, and then bring them back out. Um, but, you know, you could try it and see what happens. You know, like say Steve Wellheimer, that uh, the one of uh, Barry and I, our classmate from the Master Naturals program, Brenda, uh, that was her hive that I showed a picture of. And uh, at last count, I think she said it was pretty well full and she's going to leave hers up. So uh, if, I, I would be concerned um, about, you know, when the bees like go into hibernation, you know, I know you said the crown bees, they have a buyback program, but like if you take them down, you know, I, I would think in some ways you'd be destroying the habitat that those bees have now built um, while it's manufactured initially they've kind of, you know, nested in there. Um, if there's cocoons and they're hibernating in those spaces, um, would that not disturb that process and cycle then? Nope, that doesn't. That's why I bought those, you know. That's why he sells these. These have been put in my refrigerator. And so come uh, March, I will stick these in uh, one of my houses that uh, or hotels I've got around the farm and uh, I will have mason bees come out I would have had two years ago I, two years ago I would have had that except we went to summer camp and I moved them out of the refrigerator into a uh, uh, another container and I had purchased leaf cutters that year. And we went to summer camp in July. When I came back, all my bees were dead. Because uh, so, uh, no, the, I, you know, are there going to be 40 bees in this? I, I don't know. I, I doubt it. But there'll be a number of bees in the ones I bought from him. So, no, taking them out like this doesn't doesn't traumatize them. Again, they are solitary. They're, you know, there's, uh, every female is a queen. Uh, you know, it, it's your, now obviously with your social bees, you know, uh, Dave, Barry and all them can, you know, when you move hives around stuff, you do kind of traumatize them, but not with solitary bees. Gotcha. Um, and then we did talk earlier, um, just as a point of clarification also about, um, you know, kind of building these habitats and um, with variety in mind to attract different types of bees. Right. Um, so I'd like, you could put those into a hotel um, or maybe just have different placement of different types of houses around the property. Um, either, either of those i would assume would work correct right and, and again you know i would uh again the mason and leaf cutters are five to six off uh just like what uh heather holmes had on that one photo i had if you've got lot you know have some old dead logs that you know got drill some decent holes in them for uh you know if you see the mining bees like i had uh just don't disturb them you know have but you've got to have a water source in that area uh, and you've got to have a food source. Uh, you know, the, the mining beer, bees are going to dig, you know, dig down in and, uh, and some of the others, uh, some of the other, there are over 300 species of solitary bees. And so they all have various habitats. Some have various, uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned about the alfalfa, particular uh solitary bee you're only going to typically find it around if there's you know alfalfa uh hay to for them so the more variety the better off you 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 are the limit the limitation i, I think this group is uh, understandably the the limit you have on utilizing pesticides and come up with other uh ways to uh uh you know deal with uh predators uh thanks for the tip about the uh the dragonfly uh, interesting uh 
I'll call it integrated pest management approach I did this year. <clears throat> For yellow jackets, they don't like wasps. Uh, wasps eat yellow jackets. So I put, I had read about this and, and I'm now a testimonial to it. I took a bunch of brown uh, grocery bags and made, looks like a, a wasp net. Uh, my daughter was mowing and she stumbled into yellow jackets. And instead of going over, pouring gas in there and doing all this stuff, I took uh, one of my fence stakes, one of my portable fence stakes, and tied some cigarette string around it to a uh, uh, up to my uh, fake uh, hornet's nest and hung it there. And sure enough, those yellow jackets found another home. Hey, when you was talking about water, so is it better to have running water, still water, stagnant water? I know like, it seems like honeybees, the nastier the water, the better they like it. Um, is there any particular type of water? Uh, Clint, my, my area there that, you know, I've got, um, we've got, uh, we, uh, like I told you, I have that uh, tank buried in the ground and one of the old time timey uh, uh uh well pumps and that uh, my old wash bucket so I, i've got stagnant water so I, I don't think it matters but i also do have running water from my pond overflow but uh i haven't seen any research on it so i think just you know having it I, is uh so no I, I haven't seen any research on it just have to Trial and error, I guess. Is it something you think that, um, for example, when we're doing schoolyards and school habitats, because I've put some solitary habitats in some of my school projects, um, you know, we try to have like a a tray with some water, like a bee watering and a butterfly watering, you know, kind of stations around in those areas. But is it something we could just like leave a, a like a tub or a deep dish of some kind where you could use the, utilize yes. the rainwater that comes in, you yes. know, and without having to monitor it consistently. Yes. Cause I know, you know, sometimes they'll go out and it's completely dry and, you know, cause there's, it's, they're somewhat shallow. And then they have those containers that, you know, you turn upside down and they're kind of on a tray similar to a hummingbird feeder where it would just constantly water um, but you could potentially just use some rainwater collection in some type of a tub. Yep, that's what I do. Yep. Um, I have a question because we're putting the, the bee yard in nitros next to the river. Um, is that a source or can we use uh, river water or? Um... Yep. Yep. Uh, now be aware of what uh, Clint and Dave brought up about uh, our dragonflies. So. <laughs> If you're in, in that type of water source like that, uh, you're likely going to have some dragonflies over there. But well, uh, you, you can't be perfect, right? I mean, you. No, you can't. It's. I, it's, I, I it's, was. I was going to encourage you, Cynthia, to put out more mosquitoes. Maybe that will d distract. They, mosquitoes is the favorite food of the uh, dragonfly. So. Oh, here in Nitro, we've got plenty of those. <laughs> So. Hey, quick question, if you don't mind. I hate to run us over. I had to take a phone call, so you may have covered this and I dismissed it. Um, <clears throat> so the, the advantage here for the solitary bee is they're a super pollinator, right? right. And that's why, that's why we want them. They're not honey producers. That's right. right. And so they're native. They're, and they're native. Yeah. And they're native. So, so we're wanting them for pollination rather than the any kind of direct benefit for the human, right? The pollination is the key. Right. 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 Okay. And, and, yeah. and, and Steve, you probably already have them. You yeah. Probably... You know, so, yeah. Well, I probably do, but I, I've never noticed them. So I'm going to have to start looking for them. Let me, let me ask they you don't... this. Do you have outside, do you have outside plugs, outlets? Yes. You ever notice one of your outlets, particularly the neutral, filled with mud? No. Evan, no. Okay. But 
my outside outlets have covers on them. So okay. that's, okay. that's, that's why, but I'll, I'll be looking for them. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, well, and again, you know, uh, as I was talking to my mentor the other day about, and he, he brought up his analogy to me on things was, you know, feeding birds by us putting out habitat for, uh, the mason bees and leaf cutters and so on, you know, that are already there. They've learned how, like your, uh, like your wild bees that you're getting, putting in your, uh, your vertical hive. Uh, they're there. They've learned how to survive. You don't have to medicate them. Uh, yeah. These bees are there. So Heather Holmes approach is to, to somebody like you, Steve, that's already started out with that approach is plant more native pollination plants. That's what she would advise somebody that uses your kind of strategy with your honeybees. Don't worry about building well, habitat. Yeah. Don't worry yeah. About so the, building habitat, put out more pollination plants. So, so here's my uh, a thought that ran through my head. The mason bees are super pollinators, right? Yeah. So, the honeybee is going to be competing for a pollen source, right? Well, so hey, Shanda King um, made a good statement one time. I heard her talking about the the crossover between the two. The super pollinators, the more they pollinate, the more pollination sources and nectar sources there are for the honeybee so they kind of work hand in hand together ah that's that's a good point yeah. and so they don't intertwine they don't fight they don't compete for space nope so there's no really downside to trying to encourage mason bees that's correct right? that's okay. correct good, Very good. Again, again also when i tell you with your model of how you're doing your honeybees you know, I don't know your location. If, you know, like I was talking to my mentor about when we were, when he was using the bird analysis for me, my counter argument to him is, but I'm losing habitat here in my area. So if I don't feed my birds and stuff and do stuff, and then, you know, he, of course he has a counter argument. So I'm not sure you ever win any kind of arguments like this, you know, with, with things. I think, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's kind of neat though. Sometimes that things that nature's hidden from us that is there, and then when we put out mason bees and 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 uh, leaf cutter bee houses to see it appear, you know. But again, I I do kind of buy into Heather's thing. You know, I I don't like the idea of just leaving the house up there. You know, if I if I create that kind of environment for them and they've learned like your bees have to survive, uh, I want to take the house down to keep, keep the issue of eat here kind of from predators. But anyhow, that's, that's my preference. Yeah. Well, it's just like, you know, growing up on a farm, we fed our cattle in the, in the wintertime, you know, so, you know, uh, you, you only you only feed them when they need it, uh, you know, type deal. Well, I also was thinking that you know when you create a habitat that's outside of their natural, you know, nature created habitats, you are basically like pointing the finger, right? You're like, here I am, because it's not as well camouflaged or hidden as it would have been in a naturally built habitat. Right. Does anybody else have any more questions for Jerry or for any of other 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 B guys on the line here? Um, I would really like to appreciate, um, you know, and thank Jerry for coming on and doing that, uh, doing the presentation this way. It was very interesting. Uh, I hope everyone learned something from it today. Um, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to pivot and still be able to host our workshop, even though it isn't what we planned. I think this was very beneficial. I think a lot of people will appreciate it when we are able to share the recording as well. So does anyone else have any further questions, comments? Thank you, Jerry. 
You're yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. I, it was quite, uh, we enjoyed it. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Learned a lot. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Don, let's see. Stop recording.